as Rob says, uh, my name's Quincy Koziel. I'm the, well, officially the director of core uh, software and HPC at the HDF group. I'm effectively the chief architect for HDF5. I, I know where the bodies are buried, and I may have uh, whacked a few of them and put them in the ground myself. Um, so today, this is going to be a little fast, just because we have a little bit of compressed time, but please just raise your hand. I'd rather sacrifice a slide or two and answer some questions and get people, you know, the hot topics that they're interested in doing than worrying about getting through all the slides. All the slides are up in PDF form up on the website, so you can grab them, follow along, or get them later if you're confused about something. So talk a little bit about HDF5 as a data model, how to do uh, some very simple programming. As, as Rob was mentioning earlier, you know, there's 300 plus API routines. I'm not going to cover them all. Um, talk a little bit about how to do parallel I.O., hit the high points there, some of the conceptual things, a little bit of the programming, and then try to get into some of the performance tuning hints, although mostly I'm going to point you back at other resources for those things. So HDF5, what is this funny HDF5 thing? Um, we started out with hierarchical data format, and we had normal numbering schemes for a long time, and then we got up to about HDF4 and decided, oh, we need a redo. And we decided, we ran to keep the name, so we went with HDF uh, version 5, even though it has no relationship to HDF version 4 whatsoever. File format's different, API's different, it was a tragic, terrible idea, you should never do that. Confused people for 10 years. But that's what we got now, so that's what we're going forward with, we don't want to change the name again. Um, HDF5 has basically this open file format. It's designed to, you know, handle HPC data, big data, you know, data intensive computing. It goes all the way down. We run on cell phones, if you feel like it. Um, all the way up to, you know, supercomputers, everything. The uh, software obviously works with the data in the format. It's open source. You can go to the website. You can download it, send us patches, do whatever you want. Uh, it's big. It's fairly complex, but we do uh, like to hear some feedback from folks. But primarily, HDF5 is this data model that has an object-oriented um, ideas for storing your data and how to work with it, how to specify it in the file. So we sometimes um, talk about analogies here for HDF5. So it's similar in some ways to XML. It you know, has a self-describing nature to it. it uh, it's extensible in the typing system and has a lot of rich metadata that goes along with it. Um, HDF5 has a very large binary component to it. Sometimes we talk about um, HDF5 being the PDF of scientific data. So it's standardized, it can handle collections of data within it as well, and it's designed to be portable between all the different uh, platforms and computer uh, systems out there. Um, in some ways, HDF5 is like a collection of directories and files. It's hierarchical, it has um, allows you to do grouping and to structure things together with links between objects. And people always can say, well, HDF5, how's that compared to databases? Well, we don't do, you know, ACID properties, we don't do transactions, uh, but it's similar to databases and you can do random access and do subsets of your data and retrieve those things together. So HDF5 isn't exactly like any of these things, it's sort of a middle ground between them all. Uh, sometimes we call this our turtle diagram. So it's designed for you know, high volume complex data, runs everywhere we can, it's very fast, very flexible. Uh, it's designed to you know, en enable your applications to evolve and to move forward from very simple, here's my float array of 2D floats, and we'd like to be able to uh, get your data back 50 years. We want the, you know, the, the simulation data that you're doing now to be valid science to go back and be able to be confirming it with future things. We want the science data coming off NASA satellites to be able to, you know, track and compare with the climate models for 30, 50 years. Uh, it's a little bit unusual, but we do take it very seriously. So starting kind of the high level, the highest level of HDF5 is the data model. Um, fundamentally, the file is just a container that holds these data objects. Um, there's various components to that, various building blocks that we have. Uh, the primary ones are here on the left, data sets, groups, and attributes. Um, supporting ones here, links, data types, and data spaces, we'll all talk about them. They all get stored in a file as a container somewhere, and these are the objects that you deal with when you work with HDF5. So beginning with the data set um, object here, talk about the components of that, how it gets structured, 
it, you've hit a lot of this with NetCDFs. I'm not trying to hit huge detail here, but try to cover it and see how HDF5 is a little bit more flexible than some pieces of NetCDF, and particularly MPI. So data sets organize and contain the data elements, so it's just typically a multi-dimensional array. You can have it be extensible in any dimension you want. So if you want a seven-dimensional data set that's extensible in 3D, um, four of those dimensions are fixed, you can do this kind of craziness. No one ever does, but we have tests for it, it works. Um, so the, the elements, the data set elements are one half of a data set. Um, and the other half is a bunch of metadata that goes along to describe those. When we talk about HDF5 being self-describing, we say that it has this metadata that allows you to interpret the data in the file. And for data sets, the most important pieces of that are the data type and the data space. Uh, data type describes what an individual element is. It's a float, it's an int, it's a struct, it's something, right? Each element is always identical uh, data type. And the data space is the arrayness, right? It's 3D, 4D, how what the dimensions are, this sort of things. So to drill down in the data space a little bit, it's kind of the logical layout of the elements in an HDF5 data set, the arrayness. Uh, we allow people to have no elements. Uh, there's set theorists who like these kind of funny things. Uh, you just have a scalar. This works really well for, say, attributes or something lightweight that isn't very scalable in uh, HPC sense. But you know, the most common thing that most people deal with are uh, arrays of elements. You can have any number of dimensions you want, up to 32. Um, if you have more, come talk to me. We always get people who are like, I want five million. I said, no, you don't. You just want something else. Um, and you can have, you know, your dimensions that are currently, you know, what, where you're at now, what it calls dimension sizes here, and then the maximum dimension sizes. So you can extend things and whatever you like. Data spaces uh, have two roles in HDF5. They describe the arrayness in the file for my data set. And they also allow you a mechanism for saying, hey, within this space, select some elements that we're going to use for doing partial I.O. So in this case, three of these would be selected, and we would select three in the file, and we take our memory buffer, and we would transfer those three elements from one place to the other. We'll talk more about the selections in HDF5 later, too. But basically, two roles. So you'll deal with data spaces and saying, hey, this is a permanent part of things, and this is a selection within that that I'm going to do I.O. with. The other half of a uh, data set are data types, uh, and these describe the individual data set elements. So we support all kinds of different data types. You can put ints, floats, enum, lots of stuff. Arrays, if you want to store matrices of things, and you know each element is a Hermitian or some sort of um, uh, other matrix, you can put that in there. You can define your own 13-bit integers if you have a satellite up in space. Sometimes our sensors are geared in this way. Um, Strings and vectors and things, you can make structs, you can nest these things, you can have really complicated, confusing things. You know, a struct that has fields that are arrays of variable length sequences of strings, it's fine, you know, works fine. Uh, may be very confusing for your end users eventually, so give some thought to that, but you can do it. So, back on this in the data set, just to kind of reaffirm. We've got a three-dimensional, or sorry, a two-dimensional data set that's three by five. It's got a 32-bit integer as a data type, and in one of those cells, value is 12, right? High level, this is what an HDF5 data set is. Similar thing, much more complicated compound data type. So we've got four fields in the compound data type. Um, a very straightforward, you know, 16-bit unsigned integer, a character that we distinguish between characters and bytes, right? Characters are things you read and print, and bytes are values and numbers in HDF5. 32-bit uh, int, and here is this array data type. In this case, it's two by three by two of some floats. And the whole array is templated out with that data type, right? When you store the elements in HDF5, there's a few different ways. These are the three most popular ones, let's say. Um, Basically, you can take a look at it and say, hey, my buffer in memory is this contiguous array, or, and I want to put that directly in the file. We call that contiguous storage, very straightforward. Uh, they're very generally very simple, very fast. The, the underlying data uh, storage system understands that pretty well um, and doesn't confuse it. However, if you want to break up your data set into what we call chunks, tiles, segments sometimes people use, um, and then you want to do I.O., you can see that if you wanted to read in just this 
subset of your data set, we would go to disk and we would read in just this subset, one nice, simple I.O. If we went to try to read that from a selection up here in contiguous, we'd have to read a bunch of bytes and seek down to another place and a bunch and seek and a bunch and seek, right? It would be much more broken up. So if you have some particular need to, say, access tiles and subsets within your data sets, consider chunking those, and it's also the mechanism where we allow people to extend the data sets. You can't really have any good, effective way of taking a contiguous data set and extending it, because eventually it's going to bump into something else, and then you've got to kind of jump over that or move something else. With chunks, we allow people to say, you know, abstractly, my data set is these dimensions and these elements, but pieces of it are kind of stored around, and we create a little index in the file, and we look up those pieces, and we go get them. So that's how you extend things out. And of course, you can compress things when you have chunk storage as well. Uh, so attributes are the next piece of the HDF5 data model. Uh, they're typically user metadata. You know, this was run on this date at this time. The simulation environment was like this. The author was this, whatever. So they have a name and a value. Uh, they decorate any HDF5 objects, so data sets or groups or anything in the file. You can add attributes onto them. Um, they're a lot like little miniature data sets. So they have their own data type and a data space. They're little, the values are arrays in some sense. Uh, you, that's why we have scalar ones and other things. You can have very simple values for attributes. And we don't support partial RIO, and they can't be compressed or extended. They're designed to be small, extensible little bits of metadata that you add on to things. Finally, uh, HDF5 has groups and links in order to create the hierarchy, hierarchical data format, right? So you don't want just this bag of objects, bag of data sets sitting in the, in the container. You want to have some structure that you apply to those things. And that looks a lot like what you'd expect. Um, you create a grouping structure and say, hey, these are all my visualization pieces for analysis. This was my checkpoint. Uh, I created some attribute here on this object. HDF5 is very flexible. It'll allow you to create links from different groups in the container to a single data set. So this is actually a, a shared object in the in container. Um, we also allow you to refer to objects in other containers, so you don't have to pile everything into one HDF5 object or container. Um, there's a great deal of flexibility here in kind of boiling a lot of this down. Um, it's a lot like a file system. Everything starts with the root group, though. So when you get into HDF5 and you're thinking, how is all this structured? Basically, you can create anything you want, but you're going to start out at that root group, and then you can traverse your graph or your tree or whatever you'd like uh, from there. That wraps up the data model things. We'll go off into the software. If you want to go take a look at things, download the latest version of things. The, here's our home page. Uh, all the source code's written in C. We've got C++, Fortran, and uh, high-level kind of wrapper APIs that we ship you know, to help along with common things in HDF5. Uh, a bunch of command line utilities to do this and that with your um, HDF5 data. And we ship a bunch of pre-built binaries so it's easy to grab a copy, install it in your Linux box or your Mac or whatever's going on, Windows. Um, generally speaking, we, we put the whole uh, kit and caboodle into it, you know, the C, C++, Fortran 90, everything else, but you should look at the, the settings files when you grab one of those binaries, just uh, for example. There's a bunch of little tools that come along with HDF5. Um, start with these, there's there, you know, a bunch more than these, but the H5 dump tool, if anyone uses NC, uh, NetCDF, there's an NC dump tool that's similar. Just basically takes an HDF5 file and allows you to see what's the structure in here. Where are the data sets? What is the grouping hierarchy? How many dimensions does that data set have? What are the elements? These kind of very straightforward things. Uh, we ship with some scripts to compile HDF5 applications. These are very similar to MPI CC, right? And it just puts the header and the libraries in there so you can have a very simple way to compile a, 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 your first HDF5 application. If you're building a really complicated um, app and it's got a lot of include files and this and that, we don't expect you to use those. We expect you to kind of dig up the HDF5 header file and put the right library in there. There's only a couple. Um, put them in your make file. But these are really nice ways to get up to speed. Uh, we've got a Java uh, browser for kind of what's the structure of this look like. Not a popular HPC tool, but works well. And if you prefer Java, Python, MATLAB, Perl, Ruby, whatever. Uh, Ada, anybody for Ada? Um, 
uh, we do have all these nice uh, wrappers with examples uh, for them. So trying to get down into the programming, so this is where you guys want to use this in, on uh, Argon systems or anywhere else you go. Uh, groovy day or cake. Uh, basically, HDF5's library kind of resides in here, in this picture. You're going to interact with API routines that deal with those groups and data sets and attributes that we talked about. There's various properties to influence the behavior or the layout or something else in the file. So you can set how big those chunks are if you're storing chunk data sets or how you want your data to be stored with the file. Um, all kinds of craziness happens internally. It's 300,000 lines of code in the library. Lots of things happen. At the very bottom, we have a virtual file layer that allows HDF5 files to be sent out to disk in a variety of ways. And there's a custom interface should you have the desire to go write a HTTP uh, network plugin or something funny and you want to do it, uh, you can get access to the bottom layer and write your own. But most people are going to interact up here, possibly through a language wrapper or Rob mentioned earlier the H5 particle, H5 part thing. Uh, we ship these high level APIs. Tools all come in through these sorts of things. Everything's built up there. So when you deal with HDF5, um, you have all these bindings, .NET probably not for you guys, but um, MATLAB IDL are useful. Python, I tend to steer people just as a point of advice towards H5Py. Um, it's a nice wrapper only layer. PyTables is good, but it kind of has this do it this way kind of bent to it. It has its own particular model that it likes. Um, more than just being a wrapper. So if you just want wrappers in Python for HDF5, go for the H5Py. But everything in HDF5 when you're programming, it's got you know, a three-letter acronym. Everything starts H5 something, right? And that something is a word about the object that you're doing there. So we're trying to do object-oriented programming in C to the best we can. Um, data sets are all D, files are all F, space, you know, you can't have two Ds, right? So spaces as data spaces. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of API routines. You don't need to do them all. Very, very simple routines uh, can get you very far in, in here. And then just kind of go read the manual and explore from there. There's a ton of examples. It looks a lot like C. You know, you open your object, you do something with it, you close it. In malloc, do something free, you know, typical kind of thing. And then properties kind of influence how that occurs. How do you create the data set? How do you access those kind of things? So a very, very, very simple program would look something like create or open a file, set up a data space to describe the data, data set. Uh, there's a bunch of predefined data types. Otherwise, you define your own data type up here as well at that point. And then you often you create your data set. Do you read to writes? Shut things down. Seven, maybe eight API calls. You have a basic core of an HDF5 uh, program. Some of the other functions that you do, you'll deal with probably um, for setting up data selections and data spaces, uh, hyperslab and elements, I'll talk both about those. Uh, data types to create all kinds of variety that you can do there. Um, work with groups, attributes, they have a certain naming convention. We try to be very regular, there's a lot, but it's mostly orthogonal so you can kind of figure out what they're all supposed to do. So, talk through a couple of C examples here. Um, if there's any strong Fortran programmers in there in the audience, I can walk you through things, but I'm not a Fortran guru, so I'll do my best. Here's very simple. Like I say, we ship with these uh, compiler wrappers. Any of the programs I'm showing you, you can just go in there in H5CC, blip, and it'll create a little file or a little uh, executable for you. That's the right thing. And all these ones, until we get to the second half, are all sequential programs. So we're not talking parallel yet. This is just get you up to speed on HDF5, understand what's going on, and move from there. <sighs> Two lines, right? Create a file. Create me this file. Um, Rob and Rob have kind of covered a lot of these things. You know, I, I want to blow away the existing thing. I've got default properties for this file. Um, some file name, you get back a file ID. Uh, some, some token to work with for that file, and you know you, you close it, trivial, right? Um, 
and that'll create you a file with a root group in it, Psh, nothing else. We'll do something a little bit more complicated. We're gonna go create a data set inside the file. So we do the same thing. Create our file. We set up our dimensions here. This is gonna be a four by six uh, 2D data set. Uh, we say, hey, let's create a simple data, uh, data space. And it's called simple because sometimes we get advanced uh, ahead of ourselves. I had this really cool idea that we would create complex data spaces that'd be more like meshes and things like that that had kind of variable spacing. Um, and we never quite got to it, but we had this API routine that now says simple, so that's 18 years of development for you. Uh, so it's gonna be 2D, we're gonna use those dimensions that we specified earlier, and we put null here, this would be the maximum dimensions, and we say, if you put null in here, it just says, hey, the max dims are the same as the current dims, so there's no extensibility to this data space that we're creating. Then you walk uh, down a little further, we create our data set, um, Using the file ID, our data set is going to be called A. Um, it's gonna have a, a predefined data type, a, a HYT, so it's a data type. Uh, this is a standard, you know, typical what you'd expect on this machine. Uh, IEEE 32-bit big Indian floating point number. We're gonna use the data space that we created earlier and a whole bunch of defaults that say, hey, there's no special properties for these other things that you have ways to plug in. There's plenty of documentation, you can go look there, but for now, we just skip the properties. Um, and you close everything down, right? This is very similar to the outline that we had before, except no write in here or read. Um, kind of all the core pieces of getting a data set to disk, and it creates this nice little array off the root group. Similar idea for groups, if you wanna create more hierarchy in the file. Um, we're gonna create a group called B. It's gonna be off the root group because we're using the file ID as its parent. Uh, if you wanted to create a data set inside this group, you would have that data set create, the dcreate call here, and instead of passing in the file ID for the parent of the data set, you'd pass in this group ID. And then you'd have slash A slash B that you'd go off and create. Um, well, slash B slash A, I guess it would be. Uh, and again, a bunch of properties, but we're not gonna worry about those. And this is what the file looks like at the end if we ran both of those programs. Uh, very, very simple, very straightforward. And if you used h5dump to go dump that out, here's what the tool would tell you. Nice little text output. You say, hey, yeah, that file that you created has a data set in it. It's 32-bit IEEE big Indian uh, data, uh, 2D data space, so the the maximum dimensions are the same as the current dimensions, and you didn't write any data to it, so it's all zeros. And there's nothing in group B. So if you wanted to add some data to that data set, uh, in between the rest of our program, we'd initialize our data to something more interesting than this for loop, hopefully. Um, we'd say, hey, on this file, in, in memory, my data is ints on this machine. It's not IEEE 32-bit, floating point numbers, big Indian, um, it's saying, hey, I've got native integers in my array, you can see the declaration up there, and I'm gonna overwrite the whole data set. Now this is where some of the magic with HDF5 happens. We do type conversions between memory and disk, and we'll convert ints to floats, and Indianness, and everything else, all the way out to disk. So as long as you accurately describe your buffer, this W data, the write data, buffer that you're gonna send out to disk, and you tell HDF5, hey, this is what's in my buffer, and I want you to use the same dimensions as the file data set, we'll do all the rest. Everything will go out to disk perfectly, and then when you dump it, boom, here's your data, right? All the type conversion happened, everything's okay. So, say we took the first data set we created, and we didn't want to overwrite the whole thing, we wanted to write out a row in the middle of it. It's much more getting closer into our parallel I.O. situations, right? So, how do you describe a subset in HDF5? Uh, it's a little different than NetCDF. We have a little bit more structure and prelude to everything else, but eventually it gets out to, you know, put stuff on disk. So, you've got to describe your subset, and primarily most people use hyperslab selections, so that's what I'm gonna talk about here is I'll just call them selections. Um, and when you specify that, it does the I.O. only on that selection and doesn't touch everything else. That's what you want. So, 
two types, like I say, hyperslabs and these point selections. Hyperslabs kind of iterate through your buffer in what I would call C, you know, row major order, ba 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 ba. Uh, point selections allow you to specify, I want this point, then that point, then this point. You get the ordering with point selections that you don't have control over with hyperslabs. But they aren't quite as scalable because you kind of say, five million here, then there, then this, then that, right? In a hyperslab, you can just say, hey, here's this buffer, here's this, this block of five million elements, go do it. So, simpler. Um, talk more about hyperslabs in parallel, but you can do all kinds of crazy things with hyperslabs. You can do these nice strided blocks, you can just have a single one, you can construct lovely things like this. Uh, sometimes AMR codes have more irregular selections and you want to reflect that when you're doing your write. This piece of my code is dealing with this funny shape in my array on disk and I need to reflect that out there in the file. So when you do hyperslabs in HDF5, everything gets measured in terms of elements. It's an array, so we're gonna talk, you know, here's the offset, here's how many elements, here's the stride between those blocks, uh, here's the size of each of those blocks. Everything's done in elements and then you can do simple ones like this, and if you construct, I guess, uh, identical regions in your element space here, um, doesn't matter if you constructed this with four two by three blocks or one four by six block, HDF5 looks at it internally, kind of optimizes and says, oh yeah, sure, uh, it's one four by six thing. And, uh, your code does, if it's more convenient to describe it one way, do that, we'll just optimize it when it hits our code. So to write that row out that we were looking at in the data set, uh, we're gonna say, hey, you know, my processor, my node, I've only got this one piece, so I'm gonna describe, say, a one-dimensional array of size six, but in my file, I need to say, hey, I'm offset down by one block in this slower dimension, so fast is this way, it's C, right? Um, strides one by one by one, so we're just going across, and it's one by six, the block's one by one, so we're describing a row off in the, in the uh, file uh, space. And, you know, we'll bonk you if you select different numbers of elements, but you have to, you know, line those up, otherwise you get an error. And then the code looks something like this. So in memory, we have a one-dimensional thing. I should have made one here instead of rank, sorry. Um, Pass in dimensions, it's six, it's fixed size, that's fine, it's in memory. Um, we get the data space, the file data space from the data set on disk, this get space. Then we select this hyperslab in the file. You can see we're passing in the file space ID. We're saying, hey, set this, we're not oring, to, you can do all kinds of fun Boolean operations to build those irregular things. So first off, you start by setting a selection of blocks, and then you can or and XOR, have fun, um, different blocks into them. And in this case, we're just passing in a very simple, very regular single block. And then we pass in that memory space and it defaults to the all selection, the whole memory buffer. But the file space, we set a subset of that and they're the same size and the same number of elements. So we get that output to the file that says, hey, write this one row out. And this is how you're gonna, basically starting to set you up for parallel I.O. each process has a subset of the array we're gonna put on disk. Um, here be dragons. I'm going to tell you this, and you can go read this, but I don't want you to do anything about it. Um, the HDF5 file, file, HDF5 file format specs up on the web. Uh, it's right down to the bit level, what you can read and encounter in an HDF5 file. Um, don't do it. <laughs> it's complicated, there's B trees in there, there's funny shaped heaps, there's kind of all kinds of uh, crazy things out there, but we want to make certain that, you know, should the nuclear apocalypse come along and then somebody decides they have this old tape and they really want to read it, right, um, you can get back to it with just paper. You know, I got the file format spec, I can figure out what all the bytes in this file are, somebody could re-implement this thing as a third party. In fact, we've had two separate implementations of Java uh, readers, in one case a reader and the other case a writer for HDF5, um, who did it just from the format on up and sent me occasional questions. Says, hey, this part of the format spec is a little vague. Do you mean that or this? And they go in there and they kind of put something in the format spec and they'd get off to doing their thing. And they worked very, very well. I'm, I'm very pleased with the output from that. So it is possible to actually write a 
parser that's native to whatever you want from the byte level up. Uh, but don't do it. Just go use the C library. Don't, don't go here. Um, so touch a little bit on the roadmap. Um, this is always kind of changing. It's a little bit funding dependent. I skipped some slides here at the beginning. Um, the, the company I'm with is a nonprofit. We spun out of NCSA and NSF Supercomputing Center um, eight years ago now, but we're nonprofit. So we provide all our source code, all our uh, tools, everything is available for free on the web, basically a BSD license, do what you want. But sometimes that means we don't get to implement exactly what we would plan on doing for the features. It's sort of funding dependent. If we can get a grant that goes this direction, then we go that way and we ignore this other thing that we really would like to do. Which is why I want to see people get download a copy and do patches. If you have a good patch, I had two in 15 years. Send me a patch. <laughs> it's open source, come on. Um, anyway, um, but this is some of the directions we're thinking we're going in, in the near future. Uh, we'd like to see, have some more ways of doing concurrency in HDF5, uh, two HDF5 files. And right now we're targeting what we call Swimmer, SWMR, Single Writer Multiple Reader, where a single application can be modifying the file and any number of readers can come in and monitor and look at that file. You can kind of see obvious big data or monitoring scenarios, uh, financial companies like this, you know, there's this one source, the market, for changes to the HDF5 file, and then they can have analysis tools that come in and look at these things concurrently, no locking, um, very nice high performance stuff. Working on some internal threading, I'll maybe get a chance to talk about this virtual object layer, and we do have a prototype client server, so you think databases, they do client server kind of things, but we've got a prototype client server where you can sit a server that manages a group of HDF5 files, and then client tools can come in and access those files remotely across the net. We're very focused on performance. You can see it takes a big chunk of what we're doing. We care a lot about fault tolerance in case your app crashes, or we run out of disk space, or something else bad happens, like there's a bit that gets corrupted in the file. Uh, we try to pay a lot of attention to giving you your data back, but it's kind of an evolving field too. Um, I'll talk some more about the parallel I.O. and auto tuning side of things shortly. Just curious um, how, so we have like this HDF5 file format and, and you know, yesterday and today we've been introduced to other tools like Paraview and Visit and things like that. So how does all this stuff integrate? Ideally we don't want to have to write the files and then write separate files for checkpointing and separate files for visualization. Okay, uh, so the, let me rephrase it and see if I get it. Um, we've got HDF5 and NetCDF and other things, but we've got higher level tools like visit and pair view and analysis tools and checkpointing things. How do we pull that all together and add some convenience in there, I'd say? Um, well, the good news is that visit, pair view, all those things have really good plugins for HDF5 by this point. We've been working with those developers for a long time um, and they have nice ways to get into HDF5 files and specifically, hey, this is an AMR code and it conformed to what Visit understands as an AMR code, therefore it can read it pretty natively. So if you, if you work with a little bit of your chosen analysis tool to figure out what you should be targeting for your HDF5 or NetCDF output, you can usually get a lot of freebies that way by just making certain that you structure things and you put enough metadata in there to say, Yep, it's like this, and then the tool can handle reading it out. Checkpoint's a little trickier because it's a lot more application specific, and they're, they're not necessarily designed for analysis or portability in any particular fashion. So that's gonna be a little more whatever makes the most sense and gets you the best performance for you. Um, but analysis tools, you've, you've got some good, good options there. Yes, ma'am? So one of the things I'm confused about is the HDF5 compilers. Um, like, you know, I work with a lot of different compilers already, and now I have another compiler. Yes, the, the, the H5CC wrappers and the other things, they're just wrappers. They're just, when you do an install, whatever compiler you pass in to build HDF5 with, we'll take that command and we'll build a little shell script that says cc i dot dot slash or user local include HDF5 and dash L, blah, 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 library path, right? So that 
it's just a wrapper around a, a single, some existing compiler where there's no compiler involved. It's just a little shell script. So it's a lot like MPICC. There's no real compiler underneath that either. It's just helping you to hide command line parameters. That's all. Nothing, no more magic. Yes, sir? So um, somehow related question. Um, so two things. Um, let's assume I have my application to write HDM, HDF files, OK? Uh, can I uh, write to any hard disk? Like, uh, is it any? requirement on the server where I write to, or uh, um, the second thing would be, what if I want to extract the data, uh, or part of the data, and put it in an ASCII format, for example, or, so how hard or easy is that? Okay, so first question is storage targets. You know, what can I choose to put my data on and with using HDF5? Second part is tools for extracting some. Right, because I might know, work with an application which right. doesn't know how to read HDF5, and I don't want to add the, the whole thing. Yeah. So, sure, sure. So, from the first part, you know, whatever whatever file name you pass us, or whatever path to whatever file name you pass in, that's fine. It could be flash storage, could be you know your big parallel disk, it could be your local, you know, disk on your Mac across the network NFS. Doesn't matter. We don't care. So it does matter a little bit when you're going to do parallel I.O. because you'll need to have a parallel file system at the bottom. I'll talk a little bit about that. But we don't care otherwise, uh, generically from HDF5's perspective. Tool-wise, you've got a couple of options for doing ASCII output. The H5 dump tool I, I showed some output earlier, that does some. There's another tool which is actually sort of competing in the same space, and we provide them both, called H5LS. It gives you kind of a little way, different way of walking through the output. Um, H5 dump can actually do XML output if you want, and it can do um, just the data if you're just going to go feed it off into another tool. And there's a couple of other tools to like import and export binary chunks of data sets and things like that, should you have another tool that can understand like Fortran arrays but nothing else. Um, so there's some really good options there, and, and you can actually store your raw array pieces of HDF5 off in a separate file all the metadata in one file with kind of a little pointer to the thing over there, so that that shared binary file that has nothing about HDF5 in it, it's just a f an array of floats, um, can be reached and, and used by HDF5, but other apps can get to it too. So that, that actually is a decent option in some cases. Sure. Uh, I was wondering, I was looking a little bit at the H5PY, just like the Python. Yeah, yeah the H5PY. Um, uh, is that very mature as far as using it in parallel skills? It's getting there. So the, the question is, uh, you know, how mature is H5Pi in parallel for MPI? Uh, we work closely with Andrew Collette, the, the author of that. He's not in our group, but it's a third party thing. So it's, it, you know, I don't have direct control over some of these things. And again, open source, if you have patches, he'd take them. Um, but he doesn't do a lot of, he hasn't had a history of doing parallel in there, but he's kind of moving in that direction. He'd, he'd love to have more feedback and more users and more input in that question. So I think you could do very straightforward stuff, but maybe not full all the options and bells and whistles. Do you know how long it's been around? Okay. Uh, I tried Pi is pretty old, uh, five years, maybe more. I'm guessing. So I think there was one more at the back, but maybe they left too. No? Yes, yes sir. How long do you have funding? I mean, if we are going to stick with this one. Well, that's a good question. That's a very good question. I, I, I feel that way too. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we've been around for 18 years. We started off at NCSA in 1996. So we successfully transferred out eight years ago. The university was very gracious. They gave us all the intellectual property, transferred all our grants to us, let us spin out with their blessing. Um, we've got... Um, like any other company, it's really hard to see the future, right? But we, we're, we're confident about at least the next year's worth of funding that we can see. We've got several grants and contracts that run out well past that. Um, but, you know, we're, we're at least as stable as a, as a reasonable small company is. And it's open source, so you have it, and you can use it, you know, for as long as you like anyway. So that, that part should be fine.